This was the program at the end of the last class and on the notes from last class. Did anyone figure out what this program does? C code. Right, so uh, I, I've changed it a little bit. So there are a few things that might be a little puzzling to less experienced C programmers. So what does I bracket S mean? Is that legal C to index off an integer with a string, with a char pointer? What about that? What does that mean? OK, good, yeah. So things that look like array accesses in C, that's just shorthand for addition. This just means I plus S get whatever's in that location. And with types and sizes, there might be a, a little bit more of more conversions and things going on. But in this case, it's just, just the same as this. Which position things are is totally interchangeable. If you want to make your C code more obfuscated for other people to read, you should always put the index first and the array inside it. Take advantage of the lack of type checking when you can. What this is doing, so we're allocating. Right, malloc is asking for some memory on the heap. We're getting some memory on the heap. And we are going through a loop that looks at location s plus i. So starts at the memory we allocated and keeps looking at the next space. What do we expect this program to do? Segfault, okay, good. So why do you expect it to segfault? Good, so eventually we're gonna ask for some location in memory that this process is not allowed to ask for. And if we run it, first of all, you know, we compile it. With the warnings, it gives us a, a type error because we didn't have the cast to long unsigned here. To make up for being critical of the Rust compiler for having a redundant error message, I'm showing you the one from GCC, which has been around for about 30 years. It gives you the same message twice. This is exactly what it outputs for this. We're going to get a seg fault. When do we think we're going to get it? Let me uh, actually try running the program. So there we go. So it's running. Eventually gets a seg fault. So we got it at 10.33.8.23. If I run it again, do we think we'll get it the same place or somewhere else? Uh, this time we're getting a much, much better execution. Okay. So now we understand a little more about how memory works. Can we predict when we're going to get it? When do we get the segmentation fault? So it could, so it's, could be four kilobytes after, right? It's at some point where, so this is our address. So definitely if we're just changing the offset, we're going to be on the same page. We don't know it's going to be exactly four kilobytes because we don't know if the malloc started at the very beginning of the page. Okay, so depending on where the malloc was, we're going to get at least up to 4K but not more on the same page that we started with. Do we always get a segmentation fault after? So after we go through all those 12 bits, then we're going to change the bit here. That's the next time we add one that's going to change that bit. Is that always going to lead to a segmentation fault? Good, right? So we don't know if that's going to lead to a seg fault unless we know which pages this process owns. So it might lead to page fault if the process only got one page and we've reached the end of that page. It might not. So it might be we go more than 4K, we're going to go to the next page, we're eventually going to hit some page that is not owned by this process. Without knowing a lot more about what happens when we run a C program and what our operating system is doing to allocate pages to a process, we can't really predict very easily how long that's going to take. And that's why when I execute it, we're seeing different, different times, partly because of where the malloc happens is going to be different. Right? There's no guaranteed consistency there and maybe how many, how many pages we got allocated is different. But the one thing you should notice from all these executions, it's ending, right, we have all Fs here. It's ending when we're going over some, changing the, the bit above that. It's always going to end where there's a bunch of Fs at the end, all ones that were the last one that we were able to access, all the offset bits were one. So what about a page fault? What causes a page fault? And the names are pretty unfortunate. They, they sound just about the same. And certainly if you think about the way addresses are mapped, there's nothing very good about these names. They should really have names that are, are much more clear what they mean. The page fault has a better name than segmentation fault. So what causes a page fault? Good, right? So what happens when there's a page fault, it just means the process access some page and there was a bit here that said that page is not in memory. It's a perfectly valid page for that process to access. It's just one that was swapped out to disk. That's what caused the page fault. It means it's not in memory. That means we've got to go out to disk to get that page. So the process didn't do anything wrong. It might have not been written to get maximum performance if it's getting too many page faults. But it didn't try to access any memory it shouldn't. It just happened to access memory that's not currently available. If we look at the way pages are in ARM, so these are what the entries in the page table is. Each entry is one of these four things. And this is actually a slightly earlier version of the ARM than the one that's in the iPhone 5S or the A7 design. 
there are different kinds of entries, right? So the size of a page can vary. But what they all have is these last two bits. And these last two bits are the key of telling you whether that page is in memory or not. So if the last two bits are zeros, it means the page is not in memory. And the rest of the entry doesn't matter, and it's not there. You have to go back to the operating system now. So it's going to cause a page fault, which causes an interrupt to the operating system, which figures out if it should load that page and allow that process to do it and where it is on disk. 